Okay, so welcome. This is the third theory session. Um, as those who've joined us for the other sessions um, know, I, I'm Sandra Taylor, EFT trainer and coordinator of the British EFT Centre and a member of its decision making team. Um, and today we're going to explore slowing down and slicing it thin. And I would be really surprised if any of you in your supervision sessions haven't heard those words from your supervisor. Yeah, I've probably heard them quite regularly because they are really key things. Um, so as you know, this is one of a series. Uh, it's a series of three theory sessions and it's a series of three groups of three sessions with, with Sarah McConnell and Helena Iguibike um, doing reading group and practice group. And these sessions have been set up particularly to support people who are members of the British EFT community and those people who've been really affected because their courses have been postponed, um, courses that Helena and, and I have been running. And then by videoing them, we've also been able to put them on YouTube so that all other people interested in EFT can also kind of learn from them and, and hopefully enjoy them. Um, so I'm going to talk to you some theory and um, hopefully engage you as well in uh, exploring some of this in a, in a more practical way. Um, so I've used theory in the different sessions in different ways, really. Um, in the first two, there's been quite a lot of theory already there. Um, in the first one, which was um, attachment injuries and the attachment injury resolution model, there were various sources, including articles specifically on that, um, where a lot of the information really joined up. And then in the second session, I was looking at um, pursuer and withdrawer, yeah? And I was gathering information which was perhaps lesser known or lesser kind of things certainly I had maybe not taken on board as much as some of the more general material. And that was interesting in terms of looking at the theory because different pieces were in different places of this kind of lesser known or lesser kind of explored parts of pursuer and withdrawer. And in this one on slowing down and slicing it thin, I've chosen something that there is no article on. There is no chapter on. It's something that is within pieces all over the place. Um, but nobody has really kind of taken it as them as subjects and really explored them. So I've gathered pieces together. Um, I've also, from my own experience, um, added stuff. So that's not theory as such, but it's more um, things that I've just felt it's missing and it needs to be said. So this might be something that becomes worth becoming theory, worth becoming an article or two articles um, because they're really important pieces, but they have never been kind of taken out and explored as separate pieces like I'm doing today. Um, so I'm just sharing that because, you know, theory can be used um, in such different ways and, and I've done different things through the three sessions. Um, so, so I will now move to sharing the screen and where are we we're over there oh what happened oh okay there we go and can you see this shared screen yes yeah you can see the slideshow yeah Sorry, it just looks a little bit different over here. So, okay. So I'm hoping that 
what you can see is the the big slide yeah can you just confirm that somebody for me yes yeah we're on Sandra. fabulous thank you okay just getting nervous there okay so i'm excited about this because as i say it hasn't been kind of done in this way before and i just think these two things are so key as a supervisor i end up saying slow down slice thin again and again and again so i'm hoping that you'll get something from it that maybe just kind of helps that kind of settle into you in in maybe a slightly new way um so when we're slowing it down you know we're, we're talking about things like what just happened or what's happening right now yeah these are times where sometimes something has happened very quickly and one of the phrases that laurie brubacker uses is catch it as it flies by yeah just grab it get hold of it explore it um, and a phrase that i use a lot so if you've been in training with me um, or in supervision you, you may well have heard it it's not a full stop it's a comma that often what we'll do is we'll start exploring something, we'll think we've got to the end of it and we'll move on when actually what we need to do is slow down and go deeper and go further, yeah. Slicing it thin, slicing it thin is about making something manageable. So this might be about the intensity of an enactment that we're asking people to do or it might be the intensity of the words that we're using to help match with what the client can take in and work with. So let's have a little look at the tango because the tango is relevant to both of them. Although slowing down and slicing thin can have relevance all over the place, we're often talking about slowing down within move two. So the couple have been talking about something and then you get hold of something to really explore further. And that's where we get the slowdown. That's where we move into what's this really about? What are the components of the emotion that are here? Whereas the slicing it thin is more used within move three. That's when we're actually choreographing engaged encounters or enactments. Yeah, so it's about the manageability of the enactment that we're requesting the person to make. What's also really relevant when we're talking about these two is something called the window of tolerance. So this is something that Dan Siegel um, coined and that when you're looking for diagrams, you'll tend to find them by Pat Ogden, who does a lot of work around trauma. And basically what, what you're talking about is that we need to work with people within a tolerable level, yeah? So this level of these two lines, yeah, the the width of that will be different for different people around different themes and if they're not kind of stimulated enough um, or if they're stimulated too much and they opt out then there will be too little arousal to integrate so this is when somebody has really gone into withdrawal for example or if there is too much arousal um, and the person goes into hyper arousal, then what we have is somebody who's doing more, more pursuing in that stage. But if you're at either end of this, you're in a place where you can't really regulate your emotion. And when we can't regulate our emotion, we can't work it. We can't take in information in a clear way. So what Siegel says is that, that when the arousal falls within that window of tolerance, then the various intensities of both emotional and physiological arousal can be processed without disrupting the functioning of the system. So we can process stuff, even if it has some intensity, as long as it doesn't take us to either end of that. So what we have here is 
also, oops, sorry, the addition of something that Bromberg brought in, which is about being safe, but not too safe. Yeah, so what we need to do is we need to work on the edges of tolerance. If we just stick in the middle where it's nice and comfortable, then nothing really is going to happen. Yeah, there's going to be no change because it's just kind of nice and easy. We need to actually move them into the place where it's tolerable but challenging. Yeah. And it's in those places, the edges, that the growth really happens. As the research shows, partners who allow themselves to really become intensely involved in their emotional experience, they are the ones whose relationship changes most in therapy. You know, and this makes sense because what we need is we need deeper levels of emotional experience for there to be effective corrective emotional uh, corrective emotional sorry i think that just came out a bit muddled we need people to work at a deeper level of emotional experience so that they can have corrective emotional experiences that fundamentally change something in the way they are with themselves and with each other so why is that relevant um, well, it's about lingering in difficult emotions. And as Laurie says, this is the, one of the most challenging things for a therapist new to EFT. And, you know, it's not just challenging to those who are new to EFT. I think it's challenging at times for all of us still. You know, there are times when we know that we need to stay in places which are painful, which are really tense, yeah? And it's really important for us to be compassionate to ourselves in there and to be really well grounded. Um, it's difficult for them to stay there and it can be really difficult for us to stay there. Yeah. So this is a, a bit of me joining dots, yeah? If we're looking again at Bromberg's safe but not too safe, when we're slowing it down, what we're doing is we're moving in and we are moving into intensity as we unpack something. So what we're doing there is we're actually expanding the window of tolerance. And when we're slicing it thin, what we're doing then is we're moving something back from when it's become intolerable and the person has become dysregulated. Yeah, it's not possible to process this experience. What we're doing in our slicing it thin is we are moving something back into the window of tolerance and making it possible to process it. Okay, so that is our little introduction so hopefully you've got the gist of where we're going and what we're going to do now is we're going to move into the first part which is slowing it down yeah what just happened what's happening right now let's catch it let's go into it let's not see a full stop there let's see a comma so what sue johnson says um, amongst many people is that there is no entry into processing emotion without a slowdown. Yeah, that, that actually, if you think about it, we can only process our emotion if we slow down, because it's by slowing down that we connect with it, that we experience it, that we hear it. Yeah. And the way that we're familiar with actually slowing down and processing emotion is based on um, Arnold's work. So what we do is we get hold of what the cue is. You know, what is the danger that's just experienced? Yeah, what, what was it about what he just said or did or how he looked that, that you reacted to? What meaning did you make when you saw that, when you heard that? What did you tell yourself? 
and what went on in your body. Yeah, what, what kind of sensations were going on in there? How did you move or not move? And then what did that lead to you doing? What was your action tendency? Yeah, what were the feelings that went with that? The secondary emotions, the reactive. And as we explore each of those to a greater or lesser extent, we, we are discovering, we're opening something up. With, and then what we're often finding underneath that is we're finding the primary attachment fear. I think Laurie writes it beautifully there. The primary attachment fear which has been hiding behind closed doors. So we get hold of, you know, when, you, when I see that look on your face, I tell myself you're disgusted with me. I just feel this heavy awfulness inside my body and I just get really cross and I just shout at you. But actually what's happening underneath that is I just feel despairing and I feel as if I will never be good enough for you. Yeah. What we see in the room with people a lot of the time is a lot of drama yeah and we know that what happens between people is so fast and so chaotic and heated that what's really going on and just underneath that just isn't known yeah and when we're in that reactivity we're not in the window of tolerance yeah we've either opted out or we're just hyper aroused. And in both of those, we cannot process the experience. We cannot hear the other person. So when we're slowing people down, we're not just slowing down the person who we're directly working with, you know, if we're working with one of them. Through doing that, what we're also aiming to do is to slow down the partner as well slow down enough so that each of them moves into the window of tolerance so that each of them can process what's happening yeah we can tend to focus just on the person who's talking but actually you know the other person has to be within a window of tolerance to be able to take in some of what is happening yeah so when the spin is really slowed down what we all know is that underneath that there is sadness, there is fear, embarrassment, shame. Yeah, there's a whole load of feelings that it has become unsafe to be able to share with the other. Yeah. And us being able to tune in like that to our experience, to hear it, to sense it, to make meaning of it and to trust it. Yeah, to trust that it that it's it's real, that it that it has validity and it has something really important in the sharing of it. I mean, that's what really gets us to be able to positively adapt in the world and with our partner and with ourselves. If we slow things down and we really tune in. We can see what's going on. We can see the turning points. We can see our options in it. Yeah, we become much more um, of an agent in our life rather than somebody who's just reacting. So one of the things that just really helps is, is risk. Yeah, so most of you will be familiar with it, but the, the gist of it is right down there at the bottom it's that we repeat things we repeat things a lot so that we heighten the emotion of it yeah um we use images images that our clients have brought and sometimes offering images we speak softly slowly simply you know not loads of jargon and we use the client's words now we don't do risk all the time yeah it's really important that, that it's the times when we want to slow down and we want to go into the experience and the emotion 
that we're using risk. If we've got clients who are really agitated and they're really high energy, we need to do some matching of that energy. So we're not going to sit in sessions and use risk all the time. Um, but we will be using it when we're slowing and when we're going in. So here, here's one example. So if you just kind of tune in to your body, and as I say these things, just, just notice what happens for you, even though this isn't you at all. Yeah, what happens as the therapist kind of uses risk? So this is impossible to talk about. There's other matters, all these issues with the cottage and the finances, I've got nothing to say really. Everything between us, is, it's just too complicated and I just feel nothing, I just feel empty. Okay, so, so when your wife tells you, as, as, you know, she's just done that, when she tells you that she's giving up, that she's despairing of being able to be close to you, you feel that you've got nothing to say. You feel nothing, just empty. And that nothing place, what's that like? I don't know. Well, it's just dark. Uh-huh, it's just dark. So when your wife tells you she's despairing and she's giving up on the relationship, you go into nothing, into darkness into emptiness yeah what's the point anyway i just freeze up what is the point i don't know how to do this relationship stuff right uh-huh yeah so you freeze you go into darkness emptiness and i guess then if this was happening at home you just withdraw and she would think you were indifferent that you didn't care when in fact it sounds like actually you're overwhelmed. Like it's all so complicated. And you're there in the darkness. And you don't know what to do. And that dark place. You know, I imagine that feels really awful. I mean, we get lost in the dark. Maybe it's, it's scary. You bet it is. But there's nothing you can do. Or at least it looks that way. Yeah, you're lost in the dark, without a sign, without a direction, and it feels scary and empty. Can you tell her? Can you tell her that when you tell me? Okay, so, so some of you, can you tell me what, what happens in your body as, as the therapist slows it, as the therapist kind of takes you into the emotion? I, th I think I certainly started to, to feel, you know, I went from a place of withdrawing when you first started speaking um, and then started to feel safer. Mm you know, really started to feel safer as you slowed the pace and it kind of softened the, the feeling. Okay, that, that's lovely. Thank you, Suzanne. Yes, mm. it started to feel safer. Yeah. Mm. There was that feeling for me where um, you're kind of all het up and you could feel it with Dennis and then it, you started to breathe you know you could feel your limbic mm -hmm. system kind of coming out of that and just settling and kind of it, for me it went goes down my chest and into my tummy and just breathing really nice and deeply calm that's beautiful kate you have a lovely way of expressing that yeah that there's something that even though you're moving into more intensity what you're doing is is helping him here be with what is there and there is something that feels safer to be then with the emotion and to have it unfold more yeah. for me i suddenly felt less alone it was almost as mm. if i wasn't in that dark place there was there was that little light of somebody else sharing it with me that's lovely tony yes I am, yeah, there's that emptiness, that darkness, but I'm not on my own. 
yeah so the therapist is hearing it and then obviously by you know by it being said in this room the partner is at some level experiencing it as well even before the enactment is invited yeah and Sandra on chat, Sally says, I feel my nervous system calming down, which, you know, mm. echoes what others have said, but for sure. Yeah, that's lovely. So what we're doing then is we're moving it into that window of tolerance where we can work. Yeah, and we're not avoiding something. We're actually moving into something that is really kind of delicate and new and vulnerable. And isn't it amazing that the words that each of you are using is <laughs> alongside that is safety not alone calming yeah because we can sometimes you know as therapists feel quite panicky about going into these places yeah but hey we're accompanying somebody in a place where they feel all alone actually that makes them feel safer it brings them into a place where they can be with what is actually happening inside them more fully thank you for that yeah anything anyone needs yep there's just a couple more on chat. Nicolette says, as I got less anxious, I was able to be more curious to explore mm -hmm. with the therapist. And then Andrea says, I felt tears well up as I connected to the awfulness of that place for him. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Yes. It opens up curiosity, connection with these feelings. Yes. I think that's a really important one that it's it's only in slowing down that we can become curious about ourselves and potentially about the other yeah okay i'm going to move on thank you for that so what lots of people often want is things like helpful phrases so some helpful phrases that are very explicit about slowing down are things like can i just slow you down there that there, there's such a lot happening there and i want to get hold of it yeah um let me just slow you down yeah something just happened can we go and look at that um can we go back yeah can we go back and stay with those feelings for a little bit longer can we please just slow down yeah can we go back to see what happened when when you were saying that something happened yeah, so it's important that, that like with all phrases, you find the kind of phrases that work for you, that feel as if they contain the words that are your normal way of speaking, um, but that they get hold of the bit of, can we slow? One of the things that, that is um, important for me, and, and I hope you see it there, is that what I want is collaboration. Yeah, so I'm not coming in and ordering it. So I'll often be saying, you know, can I slow you down? Sometimes when I've worked with a couple for a while and they're really kind of used to me, I might come in and, and, and I've noticed that sometimes I can be a bit bossier because it's kind of like you can get away with it because you've already got enough relationship. And it's like, hang on, hang on, what are you doing? what's going on there? It's like you've got enough relationship to be able to do it like that. But especially, you know, in the earlier stages, I'll be very overtly collaborative. You know, is it okay for me to slow that down? Or something, I think something really important happened there. Is it okay if we go back and explore it? And what do we slow down? I mean, Laurie Brubeck has got some lovely stuff in stepping into EFT. She's really good around markers. And I think this, this will also link to um, the, the next reading group as well. Um, so she, her book is really worth looking at around this. but just putting up together some ideas from, from a variety of sources the kind of things that you want to slow down is a reaction yeah it might be something verbal it might be something non-verbal you know a turn away uh, or oh, oh yeah or anything and everything but something that you pick up as a reaction to something that has just happened in the room and reactions can also be non-reactions they can be freezes and they can be silences that are apparent. Yeah, they can be somebody um, moving from emotion to non-emotion or non-emotion into emotion. It can be a passing comment. Yeah, you always do that. Um, it can be what's called an emotional handle, which is when a phrase has just got such emotion laden in it that you want to kind of go for it. 
what we'll do is we will unpack some in-session talking, so something that's just happening now in the room between them, whether that be uh, that the cycle has just kicked off or it just be something that looks fairly innocuous that's just happened and you've just got intrigued about how they are with each other. You know, sometimes that can be a positive. You know, you talk so much about how, you know, everything you do, you react to each other in a negative way. And yet I've just seen you do something there, particularly around kind of organizing something for your child, where you, you, you look like a real team. Can you tell me about that? Um, you'll also unfold out of session events. So that might be arguments, um, differences of opinion, or again, it might be times when things went really well. You know, I, different therapists work in different ways. I often work with examples and I'll often check in with people, you know, has anything happened in the last week, you know, however small or large that you want to explore or something that, that feels significant. Um, and also I wanted to kind of acknowledge that we need to slow ourselves down. So, you know, I will slow myself down within a session. I will allow myself to take time if I need it, especially if a lot is happening around and my head is spinning and I'm like, where are we going with this? I might just say, just give me a minute. There's a lot going on there. I just need to get hold of it. Yeah, I'll slow down by speaking slowly. Yeah, and I'll invite all of us to move deeper in, and that might be through using this. Yeah, shall we look at this more? Shall we go into this? It feels really important. Yeah, so it's important for us to remember that the slowing down isn't just about them. It's also about making sure we stay within our window of tolerance, that we stay grounded in our work with our clients. And we've got to remember that for clients to be able to explore and move towards regulating their emotion in new ways, they've got to be feeling the emotion, yeah? That our task is not to keep them in the midline, the middle of the middle, where, you know, it's just really comfortable. We need to help them engage with the emotion. So some of the things we're picking up is danger, yeah? And the danger signal is, is often something that is beneath the surface. Yeah? It's like if we really reflected on a video, we would be able to say, that's where I got it from. It was that word, or it was that tone, or it was that pace, or it was that look. But in the moment, it's like, you know, can we allow ourselves to trust ourselves enough to pick up the kind of radar of the danger signals have just gone off? Yeah. Um, we don't always need to know specifically what it was for us to be able to hear danger and to say, "Ooh, felt like something just happened here. Can we just can we just stay? Can we just explore it? Um, numbness is one of those things where people often get stuck. Yeah, because it feels like a non-place. So it came up maybe a little bit in that example we were, just, we were just going for. And slowing down and staying with what seems like a non-feeling is the first step. Yeah, what we want is to open it up. And we can only open it up by slowing and staying with it, even when the client feels as if it's got a full stop. I am numb, full stop. So this is one of those places where we want a comma, yeah? What we want to do is we want to say, okay, so you feel numb. Can you tell me something about that numb? You know, can you tell me, do you feel that in any particular part of your body? what that sensation is like? Does it have a color? Does it have a shape? What happens when you just let yourself stay with that sense of numbness? 
Because as the person stays with it, it starts to open up. Yeah? As they get validated to stop and attend to it, it's like it doesn't have those really strong boundaries around it. It's just numb. Yeah? Um, underneath that, there could be hopelessness. There could be defiance. You know, I'm not going to feel anything. And just being able to say I feel numb and to have it heard and to have it validated is the first step towards it changing. Because it's like you've just been saying, to be seen, to feel not alone with that. To feel as if that way of being is being validated in this moment allows you to stay with it. It's the first step to be able to be with it more fully and it's the first step towards being able to then share that with the partner. Yeah. And another thing, uh, as well as numbness, is rambling. Yeah. So we, we often have our, our clients who we struggle with when they go on and on. This might be intellectual going on and on, or it might just be going on telling, you know, another story, another example, which keeps them from the actual emotional level of experiencing. So we all know that, that some clients, you know, absolutely need space to talk and that some of this is, is, is rambling, yeah, in terms of they just need to talk and talk to 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 feel as if they're being heard to feel as if you're being respectful of them yeah you need to give them space you can't just come in and say you know hang on there that can we just come back yeah but at some point yeah you can get in there yeah you can come in and say i'm just going to slow you down and you're going to notice something in what they said and how they said it. So the example here is, you know, a moment ago when you were saying such and such, your voice just seemed to quiver as you said to him, do you really mean that? Yeah, so you can pick things out from what is being said. And when clients are being really vague and general and, and they're kind of, it feels very flat emotionally, descriptions are really far away, the emotional level of experiencing is down to kind of one or two. What we can do is, you know, is not say, oh, that's a load of rubbish, is we need to use what they're saying. We need to slow ourselves down and we need to see what is actually going on in what they're, they're saying. And what we can do is come in and we can be more immediate. Uh, we can shift things from the vague to the vivid. Yeah, it sounds like you're, you're giving me several descriptions there. And it sounds like what you're saying is, it feels like so much of the time, he just doesn't hear you. He just doesn't know who you are and what, what you like in the world. And it sounds like that just so matters to you. And that can be if they're giving you lots of examples of how their husband has brought really rubbish presents for them over Christmases and birthdays. Yeah, so we have to make a meaning and give it some weight and offer it back to support them to go into their experiencing. And one, you know, the really big thing is shifting it from then to now. Yeah, so giving all these examples. So you're giving me lots of examples of how it feels like she's always saying to you, you're not good enough, you never get it right. What's that like for you right now? As you're telling me these examples of how it feels like you'll never get it right. Yeah, what's going on in your body right now as you're sharing this with me? So that's you slowing down. You slowing them down. So as 
the partners start to recognize the automatic steps in the negative cycle. Um, they still do need your help, yeah? So on their own, they can start to recognize this, they can start to pull out of it, yeah? But they can't necessarily go in as far as they can go with you. And they can't necessarily share with each other from such a deep space in a way that really kind of helps heal the events that have happened. So you'll often get people who, who come back and they say, you know, I noticed that we did this and I, you know, we just stopped it and we sort of went off and um, yeah, we haven't really talked about it since we've kind of just kind of, you know, got on with each other and kind of got a bit closer again. So we saved it till we could come here. Yeah, so there's a whole section sometimes in therapy where that's happening until people have really built up more of the ability to explore that together. So even when they're starting to slow themselves down and starting to notice things, you still have such an important place in still unpacking that cycle with them and doing the healing from for arguments, for example. And then this one fits beautifully with what one of you was saying about curiosity. It's once the negative cycle, once those demon dialogues really slow down, that what you start to see is much more curiosity. Yeah, there's much more space, not just for being curious about one's own internal experience, but also I really get that you might be in a different place. And I am curious about that. I want to understand that. Yeah, not seeing the other's difference as dangerous, but seeing it as something where it's genuinely interesting and wanting to explore that and embracing it. And that's where we want to get to. So, <clears throat> It's a comma, not a full stop, one of my favorite phrases. So let's have a little look at this. Yeah, we've got a little bit of time. So um, this is an example and I want us to, to work with it, okay? So we've got a couple well into stage one with you, so you've got a good relationship with them. And they are being able to see their cycle, they're being able to you know, reflect on it a little bit. Yeah, so Paul coughs, Sue passes him some cough sweets, and she says, remember, they're mine. I mean, first of all, would you even notice that? One of my favorite things in therapy is when things like this happen. I tend to pounce. I love them. Yeah, they're things that, that you know, so easily we will just kind of miss, and then we'll get onto the real stuff. But actually, something real's happening just here, isn't it? So if you notice that, what might you, as the therapist, do next? Remember, the, the theme that we're looking at here is, is slowing down. So you can video and audio again, and I invite you to, together, work on this. So how might you as therapist do something with this? Is it something, I mean, first of all, maybe, is it something you would even notice as worthy of us slowing down and exploring? Yes. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to not notice them, but when you do notice them and you go in, then they are full of riches they really are yeah and it's good when you do it when you've already got a bit of a relationship with people because then they don't think you're totally mad going into something sort of that looks so simple um sandra mary claire says on the chat she she would say what happened there is this a picture of their relationship yeah what happened just then yeah so what, what might they say if, 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 you, if they're, they're kind of used to you, but they're not used to exploring something that's just such a quick exchange? What, what do you think they might say there? Um, 
might be dismissive and just say, oh, nothing. Yeah, exactly. So how, yeah. So, well, what just happened there? Oh, nothing. Yeah. So how, how might the therapist then proceed again? Could you say kind of when you were saying, remember their mind, mm -hmm. what happened there? That's Lovely. Just... Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you might want to get more specific. So you might want to say, you know, it sounded like there was some kind of other message inside that. Yeah, remember their mind. Yeah. Sandra Jane says on the chat, are you frightened he might forget you? Oh, okay. It's an interesting one. And I think especially if that has been an issue for them, you might bring it up like that. If not, you might hold that in your in your in the back of your mind because that might be a bit much of a leap at this stage but i think you're heading in the right direction beautifully there yeah so sue might then say um he he's always um taking stuff that's mine and then not giving it back so where might we go next there's a couple of things on the chat. Mike says, I might ask them if there's a story behind that remark. Mary, oh, yes. yeah. Love it. Mary Claire says, or think what else does she think he takes? Ah, yes. Okay. And Maggie says, when I saw that you handed in that cough suite, I saw a caring attitude. Is that right? Hmm. Yes, and I think if we combine some of those, we will get something really beautiful as well, won't we? Because it, I, lo I love that last one. It sounds like there was something really caring there. And the other side of that is, you know, about there's an edge to it as well, isn't there? Remember their mind. Yeah, so we've got those two components. I liked the one which, which was, can, you know, is there a story behind that? That was a really nice one. And that allows either of them to kind of tell the story of how, you know, again and again, you know, she offers him things for different reasons. And then, you know, she doesn't necessarily get them back again. And, and then as you're slowing it down, what you want to do is you want to move into that some more. So what might be the exploration, you know, what might be where you might think that might go between them? Deborah says... Let's just pause here. When you say remember their mind, what do you notice in your body? Oh, yes. That's lovely. And I'm loving the way that, that people are coming in from different angles. And it, it, it's like, um, it's fine for us to come in at different angles. We're all different people and we'll all have different ways of kind of coming in on something. But what all of you are doing is slowing and inviting us to go into this thing that just happened in an instant and could just be not noticed at all and yet if we notice it and we attend to it and we help them go into it we may be exploring something here that could take you know half the session or even the whole session yeah because what's go on yeah i was going to say there's a couple more on chat sandra jane yeah. says what else are you not getting back here? Mm -hmm. uh, Janine says, oh, remember their mind. That sounds like you felt missed by him when you offer him support. Oh, yes. Yes. So you've got a lot of different possibilities of where this is going and how you're going to help them go into that. So the expectation will be that, you know, you're used to working with them. They're used to going into stuff. So they're going to trust you. Yeah, although it might seem like, you know, it's only some cough sweets, they're going to trust you and they're going to go in and they're going to go into, you know, what that feels for like for, for each of them around, you know, I want to support you and yet it feels like, you know, I don't even get my stuff back again. I feel like, you know, you don't value my stuff. I feel like you don't value me. And, you know, for him, it'll be things around, you know, how I don't... I feel uncomfortable taking support because I know I'm going to end up being the bad guy again and off they go. And, you know, you can then take that into much the, you know, you go right down into the attachment fears. It doesn't matter where you start. I think this is one of the things that, that um, was so valuable when I learned it 
was that it doesn't matter where you start with an example. You can start with cough sweeps. Yeah, but if what you do is you slow down and you go into the experience and you unpack it with each of them and you get them to enact together and you get them to explore, you will go into the essential deep stuff and unpack the cycle of that. There's a couple more on the chat, Sandra. Um, Maggie says, then remember they are mine. Is this possibly putting the brakes on? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And then Tony comes from a different angle. He says, yeah. Paul, what did you pick up on there? Yes, exactly. Because we don't want to forget Paul. We want actually both of them to come in here. And, and what I'm hearing, um, and I know some of you are doing it on the chat bar and therefore Sarah's the one who's, who's saying it. But what I'm liking is we're curious, aren't we? So as the therapist, there's an invite to go into it more. But our curiosity is very alive. Yeah, we want to not interpret it. We want to not tell them what's going on. We want to allow that aliveness of our curiosity to be out there, to validate them and to help them explore this. And we do want both of them in there. And Sandra, I was thinking what I might do. Mm-hmm is just make a very pro straight process reflection like it feels so so it feels like it's really important to remind him that they're yours yeah Can you say a little bit more about that absolutely it's like we can try to do things that are complicated that are double thinking where it's going mm. but also just that kind of simple clear you know, and you did it in a beautiful risk way there, Helena, just really opens it up, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, we don't want to complicate it. We want to say, hey, there's something interesting happening here. Let's explore it some more. This is what I just noted. Okay. And it's about allowing yourself to really go into something that at first sight might seem so simple and so kind of little and trusting that if you keep going, if you keep seeing the commas and you keep going down and into it, you'll get to something really precious. Any last minute pieces before we move on? Okay, thank you for your help with that. I'm going to get your help with um, another one as well as we move on now, because we're going to move on now to slicing thin. Okay, so slicing thin is about making it manageable. And a lot of the time what we're talking about here is changing the intensity of the enactment. But sometimes you'll see in the literature, it's also about changing the intensity of the words that you're using and obviously go on and explain both of those. So, oh, hang on. That just all went strange. Okay, so enactments are, we know, a fundamental part of every EFT session. Um, they can be really uncomfortable to therapists who are new to EFT. I know I, I avoided them for a long time before I launched into doing them and then obviously found them, you know, to be incredibly fruitful and, you know, use them regularly now. Um, but they're also quite uncomfortable for many clients to start with as well. They can be really reluctant to turn and share. And what we do with people who are new to enactments is, is we do slice thin. We we're not going to ask them to do the biggest, most emotional thing. We're going to reduce the risk um, and just make something really simple. So often we will um, slice something quite thin and get them to do something, even in the first session, because what we're doing then is um, Gail Palmer, has done a wonderful article on enactments. I'm not sure if that one's with Doug Tilly, 
Um, it's quite old now, but it, it's it's completely valid. It, it's just such an excellent article about different types of enactments, for example, and how you do them. So she, they talk about um, assessment enactments, which is just in the early sessions when you're getting them for the first time to turn to each other and say something, you can keep it quite small, um, sliced really thin, just to see how they do in terms of doing that. And often what I'll do in um, initial sessions is say to them, I'm going to ask you to do something. It's very EFT, but and it yeah. might feel really weird to start with. Yeah. Um, but what we do is we get you to turn and say something that you've been sharing here. We'd get you to turn and say it to your partner. Yeah. Would it be okay for you to have a go at that now? Yeah. So you're being really open, really validating, really collaborative and keeping something, you know, quite simple. So that's one way that we can slice it thin, just in that new bit, is just experimenting with something very little. Um, and the focus of the literature is mostly on the therapist slicing an enactment that they have already made an invitation about. So what you've done is, is you've said, um, can you turn to him and say da 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 okay. But actually, when you look, you know, between the lines, if you like, um, enactments can be done before, during, sorry, not enactments. You can slice an enactment thinner before it, the invitation, during that time of having given an invitation, um, and after the invitation. And what I'm talking about in terms of after the invitation, I'm talking about in the response by the partner. And... When we're talking about slicing enactments, I think all the literature talks about it being by the therapist. Yeah, that you're actively shifting something to make it more manageable. But what we can also acknowledge is that the client, in a sense, can also slice enactments thinner. So who hasn't had a client who you said to them, you know, can you sell your partner that? And you can say da 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 and then they say yes, and they turn to their partner and they kind of lift up in terms of, you know, being at a much lighter level of emotional intensity and they say something to their partner from that place. And what they have done is they've, you know, maybe without even being aware of it, they have shifted the intensity and therefore sliced that enactment thinner. And that's interesting for us because it, what it, you know, what is it telling us? Do we go back in and help them say at a deeper level? Um, is it saying that's too scary, but I haven't said that to you, or maybe you didn't even know that, um, or or what is it? It always gives us information. So if we're looking at before, um, when I'm talking about slicing something thinner before you've invited it, it's about you thinking about how might this person experience Whoa. Jane, can you put your mute on? Because you've got, yeah, it's a horrid noise coming through. Thank you. And uh, Kate also, if you don't mind, Kate McKenzie, thank you. Thank you both, that's much appreciated. So when we're talking about before, we're talking about before you've actually done the invite of can you? you've already got a sense of this might be really hard for them. So this might be a first session or it might be a later session, but you know that where they're at is in a really vulnerable place. Yeah. So you're already tuning into that. You don't have to say to your, to your person, can you turn and share it? What you can do is slice that piece thinner by what would it be like to turn and tell her? Yeah, so in this example here, it's what would it be like to tell her about your sadness right here, right now? And he says, I would feel stupid. Yeah, so then what the therapist does is slice it thinner um, at that point. And that then becomes what I would term jury. So we'll just go on a bit here. So during is is what i'm meaning by this is when you have said to your client can you turn and say to your partner 
da 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 yeah and you've got in some way or other a no response they've either said no or they've just looked to total freeze and panic or any version of that that would be too difficult they would think i was stupid anything that kind of stops them actually turning and doing it so the example here the therapist asks pete to share a newly accessed emotion yeah a newly accessed understanding um, the panicked response that he has when his wife gets really angry and directs that at him um, so he freezes in the chair at that point and he he moves into you know this is really unnecessary it's stupid for me to repeat it she's just heard it and what you know as a therapist is he's saying no he's saying he can't handle this he's moving into a kind of chaotic place where you know he it's not going to be something that he can do or would be fruitful to kind of you know you know you don't want to push him to do it so what you do instead is you help him explore his reluctance to risk sharing yeah so what he then starts to be able to do is to is, is to say you know I, i'm really anxious you know i'm really anxious about sharing that yeah and then what you do is you get him to share that instead yeah so in this case Pete can tell Marjorie that he's worried about directly sharing the feelings. You'll laugh at me and you'll see me for a fool. I'll be even more crushed. Yeah, so what it does is it moves from asking him to share how awful it feels when you get cross with me, how devastating it is inside me, to you know, if I really share myself with you, if I share my vulnerable feelings, you're going to see me as a foolish and you'll just laugh at me. Yeah, so he's moved it to a whole different level. A level that is copable with and a level which is still sharing something which is really valuable. And then what we have is what I call after. So this is in the response of the partner. So if we're thinking about the tango, yeah, we're thinking about, you know, they're talking about something. You're getting hold of something in move two and you are unfolding it. And in step, in move three, you're getting them to do an enactment. In step four, move four, you're, you're getting them to, um, to work on that enactment, yeah, to process it. And then in five, you're exploring what's happened and kind of tying the bow on it, yeah? So what we're talking about is move four. And in move four, what you often also do is, is move, not do one to five, one to five, one to five, but you often do one through to say about four and then move across to two and process something else and go into an enactment perhaps with the partner, yeah? So I'm hoping you follow that a little bit. But what we're talking about here is that move four, yeah? So he said something in his enactment. He's reached out for her, leaning forward. He has said, I need you, yeah? And the receiving partner, yeah? She's really struggling with that, yeah? So the therapist is saying, I can see this is really hard for you to take in. You're holding on to your hands. And she says, yes, I want to hold on tight. I don't believe him. I'll respond to him and then, yeah. So if you let yourself hope and trust, if you take that risk, suddenly he might not be there and that would be awful, would be unbearable. She says, yep, if, if you weren't here, I would be running out of the room right now. So the therapist makes it a little bit safer. Yeah, so instead of sharing the, the terror of it, she slices it a bit thinner and safer and says, can you tell him I'm afraid to hope? I'm afraid to put myself in your hands. And he says, you know, there's no way she's going to risk that. 
and the therapist says it's hard for her and pulls in his help. This is something else that we can do to really support one of them. Can you help her? Can you lean forward and look at her so she can see that you are reaching for her? Can you help her with your fear? Yeah, I remember you did that in the last session. Yeah, so that has sliced in the reaction of the partner who has really struggled with something that the other has enacted. And in a sense, what you're doing then as the person is moving into enacting is you is your for those people who are really familiar with the tango, you're moving from a move four and taking it across to a move two and three. Okay. So that's the after. And what I really want to be saying is that however thin the slice is, the objective of that enactment is achieved because the partners have made contact in a new, substantial and congruent way. And I, I can't say this strongly enough. Yeah, the bit at the bottom there is mine again. Slicing thin is not less than. If you've started an enactment and your client has kind of basically panicked or said no, and you've had to slice that thinner, and even thinner again maybe, you're not getting less and less each time. It's not a, I've got to save myself here. It's not a, let's make the best out of a bad job. It's actually, let me just pitch this in the right place so it's in the window of tolerance. And then we can have this congruent sharing. And often in that, something fresh comes out of it. So if you, for example, go back to the example of jewelry, yeah? Although Peter hasn't shared, I have this horrendous reaction. I get terrified when you get angry at me. Where he's gone instead is if I share myself with you in a vulnerable way, you will laugh at me and I will be even more crushed. There's no way we cannot say that is not still an incredibly powerful thing to share with the partner. So when you are slicing thinner and thinner, please hold on to what it's about, is getting to the right pitch so that it's manageable, so it's within the window of tolerance. And that what is then shared in that place is valuable. It is not less than where you started from. So the other way in which slicing it thin is also used sometimes is about us reducing the intensity of the words we use. And this is when clients really struggle with emotional words. It might be that they're not used to them, um, that they just seem too big in terms of because they're feeling it really small. So like withdrawers who are not used to really being connected to emotion, um, they're not gonna connect with terrified. They might connect with uncomfortable, yeah? But you might also have people who are um, very easily activated around emotion and for it to be able to keep within a window of tolerance, you need to keep the emotion words lower. And sometimes we just pitch that at the right level because we follow what the client is using. And other times we get it wrong and we have to kind of maneuver ourselves. So for example, we need to slice it thinner. We might use the word scared and we can see that's not hitting home. We might need to bring it down to afraid. We might need to bring it down to anxious. We might need to bring it down to worried. We might need to bring it down to a little concerned. It's getting the right pitch 
so that the person can stay with it because if the person can stay with it they can then start to access it so it doesn't matter which level of word they're using all you want is them to be in a place where they can then start to access it yeah so you might be thinking they're terrified and they're saying i'm a bit uncomfortable but if you stay with terrified the mismatch is going to be there they're not going to be in a window of tolerance they're not going to be tuned in with you but if you stay with a little concern what's that like that little concern they can stay with it and they can unfold it yeah in a sense it doesn't matter what objective word you're using for it what you want is to use what helps them be able to stay and access it and what you find is that trauma survivors in particular need that to be finely tuned they need to engage at what's called a working distance from emotion they need to get it in the right place which is that window of tolerance yeah and that window of tolerance might be really really small for some people yeah because of the traumas that they've experienced and your work with them on the edges of that just helps slowly 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 expand it yeah so yeah we slice it thinner to reduce the intensity to enable them to stay with and access the emotion okay so we have another example here does anybody want to ask any questions before we get you to help me work on this one any questions about slicing thin or anything that you particularly took from what i've just been saying you can use your video and audio or you can use the chat bar Sandra, it's not so much a question as just more like, I really like what you emphasized about slicing thin is not less than. Mm. I just think it's so crucial that you're really defining it. It's still as a success because it's about the contact. It's about sharing something that's real for them. And if they're anxious about sharing, that's what's real. And that's what that's what's worth sharing. So I really, really like that emphasis. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. You're helping me understand getting the words that are usable for the client so that they can stay in their window of tolerance. Somehow putting it together in that way is helping me so that I can not get stuck on my idea of the word <laughs> that describes it and can loosen up to meet them where they are and where, what's workable for them. Yeah. Absolutely. Not quite shovel them into my idea of <laughs> what the emotion is or whatever really, really helps me putting it in the context of their window of time, <laughs> the workableness. I think, you, I think you've expressed that really well, Sandy. Yeah, it, it's not about how you want to label it. It's about how they can work with it. Sandra in the chat Tony says very helpful on reducing intensity I get scared by words like shame mm. yeah mm. absolutely and it's helpful isn't it when we can connect with our own stuff you know what are the words that we're comfortable with and not comfortable with how do we sometimes slice that emotional intensity thinner um, what happens for us when we try to step into a more intense word or a less intense word yeah, or when it's pitched really well. Uh, uh, what's this? This is showing me. Don't know, can you hear me? Greta. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Greta. Uh, hi. Um, it, what's this showing me is that really what we're what we're doing is we're looking for a way in. Mm -hmm. And this Absolutely. is yeah. This is what this is really highlighting for me. And it, and it doesn't matter the intensity of the word, you know, if we feel it's anger or if I feel it's 
you know, rage or anger or despair. That's not, that's, that's not important. What's important is to find a word that I can actually meet my client with to find a way in. Again, beautifully expressed, Greta, yes. It's not, you know, for some objective meaning or accuracy. It's about how can I meet my clients and support them to access something that has previously been too unsafe or dangerous to do? Yes. How do I make it safe enough? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm getting so much out of this. It's wonderful. Thank you. And Sandra, from the chat, Deborah says, slicing it thin somehow expresses a desire for a more sensitive attunement, supporting a client to feel felt. I like that. Yes, a more sensitive attunement is a beautiful phrase. Yes. It's about us meeting them where they are. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if you can help me with this example. Okay, so the therapist starting with, so you know this feeling of expecting to always get it wrong, to be a disappointment. You can feel it in your body right now. Okay, so you want, you're now going to move towards an enactment. Move three of the tango. So how can you start with a, a nice thin slice? How can your invitation be a thin slice? So this is the before bit that I was talking about before. I, I don't understand because in a way I've understood that you've just out loud mm -hmm. evoked quite deeply mm -hmm. the experience of the person you're about to ask to turn an enactment. What, why do you want to back off at this stage without knowing that you need to back off? Okay, so I'm assuming, so I'm, I want to do a before because I know this is a really tough one and I want to um, just make it manageable, yeah? Okay. Yeah? So I, I get what you're saying, that it can seem like backing off. Yeah, if I, if I slice it thin at this point, yeah, am I backing off and taking away from some of the intensity? Yeah. Yeah, I just didn't quite understand the meaning, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, no, it's helpful, Nick. Yeah? yeah. That that if we're always ultra cautious, then what will happen is we can take away from holding at a good level the intensity of the request. So we don't want to every time do the before slice thin. Yeah. And what I'm talking about there is the what would it be like? to consider turning. If we said that every single time, there will be times when what that does is reduce the pitch of intensity and just deflect from it. But there will be other times where we know that, you know, this is really early in our work together, or I know this person has moved into an area where this is really new, where this is really scary, and I want to go gently with them. Yeah? So just um, get, get really detailed and specific and, is there a possibility that unintentionally in using the phrase, what would it be like, mm -hmm. particularly if you say it to a more cognitively wired person, they will appraise that as, as, as being at the more cognitive level and they may exit more. So mm -hmm. um, might we need, um, if, if we happen to be able to remember it, to be very, very specific and, and sort of wise about the, the exact choice of words um, because we might find that the, the person it, it becomes a sort of they recognize it they appraise it when when your phrase um, what would it be like uh, that their brain appraises it as um, mm -hmm. you know tuning them more into okay. conceptual mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um, so what we want to do is we want to just you know, one of the things that we'll do is we'll experiment. We'll experiment as we're learning this and we'll experiment with each client. Sometimes 
if somebody is really cognitive and is really not getting very in touch with feelings, then a cognitive appraisal of it will still be dipping in to something, you know, will be still a reflection of how difficult or easy is this. And that might be an achievement. Whereas for others, as you're saying, it might be a deflection and it might be more important to be saying, you know, how about you turn and you share this? Yeah. Sandra, so, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I was just thinking of like what Zeke's saying about phrasing mm. and there's something about imagining something yes. and, then, and then what it evokes in you when you imagine. I know if I imagine mm. sort of stepping out in front of a car, then I, you know, I can feel it in my body, mm -hmm. you know. So it, the wording might be something like, what happens if you even just imagine yeah. turning and sharing that with him? Absolutely. That's lovely because then they have a picture of it in their mind. Okay. So what we have is we then have um, the person responding to that. So here's my example. Okay. No way. You know, I don't think she gets that at all. She won't understand. So where might you go next? Can you imagine telling her that, that it's too hard for you to share with her because you feel she won't understand? Very nice, Sandy. Very nice. Okay, I'm going to respond again. I've got the, I've got the ideas here of what might come up. So my next one is... Um, no, no, I've never told her anything like that before. You know, she'll think I'm pathetic. She'll think I'm weak. I think I'd like to explore a, a bit first mm -hmm. with him mm -hmm. what that means to him before I asked, sliced it thinner and asked him to sh share with his partner. Yeah, so you can unpack it a little bit unpack more. Unpack it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the challenge is that you don't want to go too far off. You want to keep holding yeah. it towards enactments, but unfolding yeah. it a little bit more is a nice one. Yeah. Right. Okay. So how might you unfold this one a little bit more then? Yeah. I've never told her stuff like that. She'll think I'm pathetic and weak. Well, I think I might, I might repeat that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and... I, then at that stage, I might be saying something like um, something about how hard that is for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. He feels, you know, mm -hmm. that, and, and sort of explore that a bit. Mm -hmm. I can't quite get into this, but then, yeah. to, then yeah. to move it on just to be able to, to try, you know, for him to say it's, it's so hard for me mm -hmm. to tell you. Um, I, no, I haven't got this right. On that level though, but it's on the level of, not, not for him to you reuse the words pathetic and weak to her, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah? But to say that I, f or just to say it makes me feel so weak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's lovely. So you might explore it a little bit and then again invite, can you tell her that? Yeah. yeah. Can you tell her this is so hard that you might yeah. see me, you know, if I, if I tell you how I feel, you might see me as really weak. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And can you see yeah. how as we're, as we're slicing thinner, we're not going into lesser stuff. We're going no, into really, we're still no. unfolding every way, no. aren't we? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I've got another one. I've got another no. You know, even that is too much. I, I, I have never shared with her how I feel. I've been taught that sharing feelings is weak. Yeah. I don't even know if she wants me to share her, my feelings with her. Yeah. I think that I would want to pick up on. I don't even know that you want me to share with you. Yeah. I think, yeah. Yes. So then it could be, wow, can you share that with her? 
you're mm. so unused to this you've been taught yeah. how yeah. you know sharing feelings is weak you, yeah you don't yeah. even know if she wants to hear your feelings mm. yeah okay i haven't got another example mm. of after that we've sliced in about four times there <laughs> and can you all see that as we as we have done that slicing thinner we've continued to process and we've got into some really important things there but slicing thinner is not slicing less than. I'm going to come back from, from sharing and to be on the big screen with everybody. And we've just got a few minutes for you to share anything from that example um, or, or anything else that you would like to. Just a quick one on this chat, Sandra. Maggie says, would you validate him after each doubt and refusal? Absolutely, yes. Thank you for um, putting that in so that we can emphasize it, yes? Every time, we do not want the person who we're slicing thinner with to feel as if they're being bad or they're being you know, not a good client or that they're blocking or that they're not good enough. We want to make sure that it's like, okay, I really get that. Yeah, you, what are you telling me? Something so important. Let me see if I've got this right. Yeah, that we want to hold them validated through that whole process. If you'd like to put your video on, put your video on and you can unmute yourself and just have five minutes of, of of sharing from this example and from the whole session. Hello. Thank you, Sandra, for today's session. It's so beautiful. Um, I do have that moment. Sometimes it's a very, very active. I will, I will freeze. Mm -hmm. And then I, and going in, it, that's where my, I need to work on them more. That's, yes. Yeah. It's a challenge, isn't it? And, and I'm hoping that today's session will help people just feel a little bit more comfortable to slow themselves down and to, to let themselves be curious and just gently go forward and go forward in, in that way that is attuned with our clients. I, lo I love the way that you've um, presented in, in that you're, you're a real role model for that. Mm. And um, yes, it, it, that's um, that's really what I've taken away from it. How, how to do it, you know, slowly and calmly, mm. slicing it thin. Thank you. Yeah, um, as, I'd like to echo that. <laughs> yeah, as, as I've seen you go through this process, you are really demonstrating such a good connection with the person who you're slicing it thinner with. Yes. And I just feel that, you know, that is such a good model for the partner to be a witness to. So mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. it's got so many benefits. Mm -hmm. Yes, because every time we're doing it with the one, the other one is there as well. And, and by us kind of, you know, being calming and validating of one it will usually help the other one also move into a window of tolerance because it has a real impact on them yeah. and because what we're always doing is is tuning into both of them you know mm -hmm. that we have to take care because you know we don't want you know to be excessively tuning into one and not the other or they're going to feel really left out mm -hmm. but of, you know what what people get to do is really trust we're there for both of them and tuning into both of them and that really kind of helps calm and helps people access their experience and share it yeah thank you yeah mm. sandra uh, just a comment from the chat anna says slicing it thin takes the partner deeper down into emotion not further from it beautiful yes that that is a nice way of, of of saying what i was saying about yeah slicing thin is not slicing less than as you saw from that last example as we took it down you know sliced it thinner and thinner and thinner what was happening is the person was going into experience more not less it's just that it was different from the intensity of where we began 
And it's like, we, we don't have to fear ending up in a different place. I think that's sometimes what happens to us. It's like, but we've lost that. Mm. It's like, so what? Look at where we've gone. Mm. That's my experience, Sandra, that's Janine here. Um, Hi, Janine. That the, if slicing it thin, it isn't less. But I, if I've started off at a point, there's something in me wants to get back to that point. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of not really then taking on that they've done all this work and they've gone to a place that has been vulnerable mm -hmm. because I still got in the back of my head. I wanted them to say, yes, uh, whatever. Yeah. 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 And sometimes, you know, just keep a little reminder in your head of where you did come from because sometimes a link back to it later is the exact thing you do want right. whereas other times it is about just let go and go with where we're actually going because we don't want to stay with the tube of cough sweets do we no. we want to go with where it goes <laughs> Sandra you. I'm just reminded of the a phrase that always helps me slow is fast and less is more mm. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Sandra, I just, this is Analia. Just want hi. to say hi. Um, it was, it was, uh, let me, let me put the camera. It was fantastic to, to see all the work that you've done here because it's in the literature. It's so difficult to find this topic. It's not like you can find this topic as it is. You just, mm make it uh, make it happen so nicely just love it and um, and yes i mean and the other thing is that um while you were explaining this and 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 i thought we were in move three of the triangle sometimes is that we need to go to move two mm -hmm. and then go back to move three yes that take us away from the the our plan as a therapist Mm -hmm. So therefore, sometimes it's like you are a, a vulnerable as well as a therapist mm -hmm. in the sense that you just, oh, where I thought we were going to do step four or step, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, move three or move four of the tango and I need to go back. So in a way that puts you as a therapist in a vulnerable position mm -hmm. with their vulnerability as well. Absolutely. It's a challenge. And I was talking to somebody about it just earlier this morning. It's a challenge because it's like with any model, we have to learn it and we have to learn it in a fairly simple and straightforward way to start with. You know, that we have to have it in a way that we can get hold of and that we can kind of see its value. And then it's only as we kind of really get hold of that, that we can start to use it as more of an art form and we can move around in it much more thoroughly. So it, it is, you know, a challenge in terms of that. What we, we can only move around in it when we kind of get why we're moving around in it. We're not just doing it because we're floundering and lost. Um, we're doing it because we're, we're making sense of it. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. You have enriched my presentation so much by your involvement and by your additions. I mean, that's just been absolutely fabulous. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you thank so you. much. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to stop recording, but I'm...